That may be the greatest catch I've ever seen in my life. Okay, so let's go through and let's talk about week 15. Really hoping that everybody here is looking like they are going to be in a good spot to win this week. Now, please, because I know it's a little bit of a different scenario. We have a couple of games to be played tomorrow, a couple of games to be played Tuesday as well. Go to the comment section right now and please let me know what you need to win your matchup. Because obviously, I mean, I'm sitting here in a lot of the high stakes leagues we have going. I'm just looking at all the standings, trying to figure everything out, mainly from a best ball standpoint, seeing how many teams we're going to get to advance. But please let me know down there in the comment section what exactly you need. And also, before you skip the beginning of this, we have a very exciting announcement. January 15th in Tampa, Florida at 3 p.m. Eastern, of course, we're in Florida. We are going to be having a Fantasy Flock Network meetup. Please, if you are in Florida, you better be there. If you are not, I am going to be legitimately pissed. We may all show up at your door to drag you to that meetup. And if you are not in Florida, of course, you can always fly down, but don't feel the need to do that. And if you go sign up on Underdog Fantasy, of course, the sponsor of this video, and we get 10,000 signups on Underdog Fantasy by the end of the season, they've agreed to fly multiple people down to Tampa, Florida, and put them up in hotel rooms, pay for food, pay for drinks, the whole nine yards for that flock meetup. So please take advantage of that. Go sign up for Underdog Fantasy. Use promo code FLOCK and they'll match your first deposit dollar for dollar up to $100. You can find the link in the live chat, find in the description of the video. Lastly, drop a like, subscribe to the channel. I, I think that's all we got. Let's dive into this recap. And the first lesson learned that we have for the week is it doesn't matter who you draft. Your draft this season, I mean, take it, throw it out the window. If you got Jonathan Taylor, Hurrah. I mean, if you got Cooper Cup, great job. Outside of that, on a week-to-week -week basis, it is ridiculous that we are in the fantasy football playoffs and to go and look at the highest scoring players by the position. I mean, going to running back. The running back won this week so far. Keep in mind, we're recording this at the beginning of the Bucks game. I'm actually kind of watching it on a second screen right now. But Duke Johnson, the running back one this week. Jeffrey Wilson, the running back three. Devin Singletary, the running back six, Amir Abdullah, the running back eight, Donta Foreman, the running back 10. I mean, Craig Reynolds, I, I, I didn't know he existed two weeks ago. The running back 11 here, you Justin Jackson, the running back 15, like the owners who went through and they worked the waiver wire and made good start set decisions. Those are the owners who won it this year. If you were someone who went, you know what? I'm a great drafter. I'm going to go through and I'm going to draft 100 teams and we're just going to let this thing play out. You most likely lost your league. You couldn't have done that this season. You had to be the guy going and putting in the extra work. You had to be going out there and grinding the waiver wire every single week, going over to the wide receiver position. I mean, Gabriel Davis, wide receiver three, Christian Kirk, wide receiver four, Amara St. Brown, wide receiver five, Russell Gage, wide receiver six, Marcus Valdez-Scantling, wide receiver seven, Josh Reynolds, wide receiver 11. Like, what are we seeing here? What are we talking about? Just crazy that we are in the fantasy football playoffs and those guys are coming out and getting it for you. And then also going over to the tight end position. This is our next lesson learned. Maybe just going in from a season to season standpoint at this point. I, I know it's hard to predict. May, hopefully, for the love of God, please don't make us deal with the COVID list next year. But hopefully we are in a better situation. We don't know that for sure. Maybe the situation is you just go out there and you take those elite level tight ends. The first week of the fantasy football playoffs and you got Travis Kelsey in a tight end premium format coming out and dropping 46 fantasy points. Mark Andrews dropping 40 points as well. This was the week of the elite tight end. I mean, in all those best ball tournaments, you're essentially just scrambling at this point to see how many shares of Travis Kelsey you have, how many shares of Mark Andrews that you have. And it's, it's, it's a good life to be someone who was drafting Kelsey and Devontae Adams every time they could in the first round. And now our next lesson learned is it looks like this New England Patriots defense truly is one of the best pass defenses in the entire NFL. Now I know New England loses that game. I know that Indianapolis, of course, wants to lean on the run and they are doing so successfully. If you're looking at the box score in that Indianapolis game, going to be a little bit skewed based on, I mean, the long Jonathan Taylor touchdown run at the end of the game. But nonetheless, you get Carson Wentz coming out with 57 passing yards, 
one passing touchdown and one interception as well. I mean, he has 57 passing yards. Whereas if you're looking at just this team going over 200 rushing yards, I think at this point you can probably safely say that anybody going up against the New England Patriots defense from a wide receiver standpoint, a quarterback standpoint, we should be going through and looking to avoid. Now you are going to get Josh Allen going up against New England next week. So I think you're probably going to have to go through and start Allen, but you're going to have to lower your expectations dramatically. Like remember two weeks ago, whenever the New England Patriots and the Buffalo Bills went up against each other, we had Josh Allen way lower in our rankings than usual. And now our next lesson learned is Donta Foreman is a running back that needs to be respected. Okay. This is a guy that we came through and I said, you know what? Trust me, hook him horns, love the man. I mean, of course, as a Texas X, as someone who graduated from the University of Texas, I want to go back, look at the glory days of our team being horrible and Dante Foreman pulling us out of things. Now, coming into the week, I was not buying into Dante Foreman. The reason for that is, I mean, with the addition of Jeremy McNichols on this roster, we were saying, hell, I mean, you're not going to be able to go through and play any of these running backs because this backfield will be split into thirds. And that's kind of what happened. I mean, you had Dante Foreman with 31 snaps. You had Dontrell Hilliard with 29 snaps. And you had Jeremy McNichols with 23. So this backfield was split into thirds here. But it simply didn't matter whenever Dante Foreman, on the 31 snaps that he played, he had 22 carries and three targets. So Dante Foreman played 31 snaps. And out of those 25, I'm sorry, out of those 31, he had 25 snaps played where the Tennessee Titans try to get him the football. Obviously, this is the running back that I, I don't want to say won the game for them at the end. He tried to. He, he tried to do everything he could, picked up that first down. L looks great. Looks every bit of the part. And now, in that same game, can we safely say at this point, maybe it's because the Deontay Johnson injury, can we say that Pittsburgh has one of, if not the worst offenses in the entire NFL? Now, I know that, I mean, this week they get the W. Yes, they do. But just watching that game, literally what would happen is Tennessee would get the ball. They would turn it over. They would be in field goal range for the Pittsburgh Steelers offense. This offense would go out there, maybe hand it off to Najee Harris twice, and then on third down, have an incompletion, and then you have the kicker coming out to get you a field goal. I mean, this week you had, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, 148 passing yards for Ben Roethlisberger and 18 rushing yards for Najee Harris. Najee Harris is the only running back that got a carry in this game, and he had 18 rushing yards. Obviously, this is an offense that dealt with a decent amount of injuries. I mean, they have the injury to Juju, now the injury to Deontay, also another concussion for Pat Frymuth this month, month will be very concerning. I think another thing we could say is just this Pittsburgh Steelers team, yes, they're winning games, but looks like possibly the worst offense in the NFL. Now, our next lesson learned is going back to those running backs at the very top of fantasy football this week, Devin Singletary, bell cow running back in one of the most productive offenses in the NFL. Devin Singletary, I mean, coming out 22 carries, 86 rushing yards, the rushing touchdown as well. If you're looking at these snaps played, I think that, I mean, here Singletary clearly shows that he is the bell cow where he has 65 snaps compared to Matt Breida at three. And Zach Moss was a healthy scratch in this game. So this is honestly something that we're going to have to dive into a little bit more this off season. But it seems every single year where you identify these, I don't want to call them league winning running backs. Devin Singletary is not a league winning running back. But I think when you identify these inaccuracies with fantasy football draft prices, where it is, is by going over to elite level offenses that you know are going to be great. Some examples this season could be Arizona, Buffalo, Tampa. And you look at committee backfields that we don't know how the depth chart is going to shake out. So you have both players being pushed down draft boards to the eighth, ninth round, like you saw with Ronald Jones, Leonard Fournette. Like you saw with Zach Moss, Devin Singletary. Like you saw with Chase Edmonds, James Conner. And just taking your shot at one of the running backs there. Because if you then become a running back 
that somehow is able to go through and take over that backfield and become an every down player, whether that's your Leonard Fournette and you're just so much better than Ronald Jones, whether that's your Devin Singletary and you have the trust of the coaching staff and Zach Moss doesn't, whether you're James Conner and all of a sudden when you have the injury to Chase Edmonds. I think that is how you become a league winning player in fantasy football. So that's going to be something that please hold me accountable to this next season when we're going through and we're taking our shots at those later round running backs. Because I think based on how this season's played out, I'm going to have almost the same exact strategy that I had coming into the season where I'm going to be willing to take one of my shots on a running back in the top three rounds, grab someone like DeAndre Swift. That was our guy we are going after this year. And then outside of that, stack up those elite level wide receivers. Y'all know, I mean, my common draft start this year was going with either Kelsey or Devontae Adams in the first, following it up with Joe Mixon in the second. And if we didn't get Joe Mixon in the second, then DeAndre Swift in the third. And then we're hammering in guys like Chris Godwin and just wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver. I, I think that's kind of what we want to be doing. And then taking your shots on those running backs in uncertain backfields later on the draft that are playing in great offenses that would have the upside if they go through and they can take over. I think that Devin Singletary, May fit that mold. I, I know it's a tough matchup coming up against the New England Patriots, but still, I mean, you just had Jonathan Taylor pop off. And now our next lesson learned is it looks like Brandon Cooks is good at football. I guess that's, I mean, a big takeaway that we can have here. Obviously, it was a pretty good matchup going up against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Maybe we can talk a little bit about Jacksonville that, I mean, if you looked at Las Vegas, the Jacksonville Jaguars were five point favorites coming into this game. Obviously, Houston comes out and stomps them. Brandon Cooks only behind Tyree Kill in fantasy points this week. He has back-to-back -back weeks with over 10 targets, back-to-back -back weeks with almost exactly 100 receiving yards. This week, he comes away with multiple receiving touchdowns at the same time. I, I don't know if we can say much else. I don't know if we can talk on this a little bit more because, I mean, there's not much to say. Brandon Cooks looks like a player that you're going to be starting every single week and a player that it looks like you're not going to be starting every single week is actually going to be Amari Cooper. And now here with Amari Cooper, I mean, we were kind of going through and trying to pivot off of him this week anyway, based on the fact that this team wasn't going to have to throw the ball against a very, very, very bad Giants team at this point. But Amari just continues to show you that this, he is one of the least predictable wide receivers in the NFL. I mean, whether you're looking at his fantasy points on a week to week basis, whether you're looking at the volume that he's getting in Dallas, I mean, he really hasn't had a double digit target game since week eight against the Vikings. He's had two games with nine or more targets this year. I mean, if you lower that number down to seven targets or more, he has had a total of four games. I mean, looking at what you get every single week with Amari. I mean, of course the first week he has 17 targets. I, I mean, life is great for anybody who drafted Amari Cooper and I have Amari Cooper in some leagues. Y'all know, I mean, I, Coming out of that 2015 draft class, coming out of Alabama, Amari Cooper was one of the best prospects coming into the NFL that I've ever seen at the wide receiver position. I fell in love with the man. Like back in 2015, 2016, 2017, he was one of my favorite wide receivers to watch, one of my favorite wide receivers to root for. But at this point, I mean, you're looking at the targets. Let's remove that first week with 17. Since then, 5, 4, 3, 6, 8, 13, one spike week, 5, 4, 2, 7, 5. I think Amari Cooper may be a wide receiver three going forward. I mean, especially knowing that a lot of those games were also played with no Michael Gallup and Gallup should be good to go from here on out. And now let's go over to our next lesson learned. And it looks like we are chasing after the wrong wide receiver in Arizona. A lot of people are asking who we are going to be going with between Christian Kirk or AJ Green. And I thought AJ Green was a fine option. I mean, looking at AJ Green, he was going to be the guy that profiled to be a little bit more on the outside or replace DeAndre Hopkins. Nope, I guess that doesn't really make sense here. AJ Green, eight targets, four receptions, 64 receiving yards. Christian Kirk, the guy to come out here. And Christian Kirk being a dominant top five wide receiver this week. Does so with volume at the same time against the Detroit Lions. 12 targets, 9 receptions, 94 receiving yards, and the receiving touchdown. Now, I know a lot of people are going to want to go through and just talk down on this entire offense. I know a lot of people are going to be frustrated with the game against the Detroit Lions. Very similar to what we said week one with the Green Bay Packers. Football is one of the most random sports that you can have, which is why, I mean, football is fun. Because if you're a Detroit Lions fan, if you know that... 100% of the time they go to play Arizona, they're going to get crushed by 20 points. Why would you ever watch the game? The 
one time that Arizona doesn't prepare well, the one time that, I mean, you just have uh, some freak instances, you have some turnovers where there shouldn't have been. I mean, you can get that game completely switched around. I, I don't think we should be reading too much into this. I think it was just one of those random occurrences that's probably not going to happen again. I'm not too concerned about what you had with this Arizona Cardinals offense. And now our next lesson learned is something that we were talking about last week. And honestly, one of my better calls this week is we went out on a limb. And if y'all were on the Sunday morning live stream, I am sure y'all heard me say this over and over and over again. I'm sure you were tired of hearing me say it. We were saying Amara St. Brown is a wide receiver. You have to play every single week going forward in a full PPR format. The reason for that is once you remove, and I know you're tired of hearing me say it, but when you remove DeAndre Swift, when you remove TJ Hawkinson from this offense, all of a sudden, I mean, there are a ton of targets available. I mean, back-to-back weeks over the past two weeks with 12 targets, and we were saying, okay, well, yeah, he's a clear play here in a game that the Detroit Lions, we thought they were going to be trailing, having to throw the ball. He gets 11 targets this week. He gets eight receptions, 90 receiving yards, and the receiving touchdown as well. Top five wide receivers so far at the time of this recording. Next week, going up against Atlanta as well. Assuming you have no DeAndre Swift, T.J. Hawkinson's already ruled out this season. I mean, literally, Amaro, Sam Brown, Hunter Renfro, they're the same player for me. They're slot wide receivers that generate separation that aren't necessarily athletic. I mean, they're not playing the best offenses, but if you're getting to 11, 12 targets every single week and you're catching them at a high rate, 10, 8, 8 receptions, you can see the same thing with Hunter Renfro. You know the catch rate's going to be relatively high whenever these wide receivers are running their routes closer to the line of scrimmage. I mean, Hunter Renfro in his own receptions, 8, 9, 13. I, I can think they're the same player. You go through and you play both guys, assuming that they're stud tight ends out in their respective offenses and there are targets available over the middle of the field. Now, going over to the running back position, let's look at Duke Johnson here. And with Duke Johnson, I know a lot of people are going to be running to pick him up off the waiver wire. I know a lot of people are going to be screaming that Duke Johnson's a league winning player. And initially, when you see the stat line, of course, you want to think that. Okay. So, I mean, he did come out and he had 22 carries, 107 rushing yards, multiple rushing touchdowns. And I know your life looks good. I mean, he's the running back one at the time I'm recording this. But in reality, I don't necessarily think we should be running out to pick up Duke, Duke Johnson. Like, I, I know this is a boring take, but with Duke Johnson, let's all come back down to earth. Let's realize that this was a game against the New York Jets. That's one red flag here. And another thing is if you're looking at the snaps played by Duke Johnson and Miles Gaskin, I mean, if you see that stat line for Duke Johnson, you'd assume, oh, gosh, hell. I mean, this is a running back that probably, I mean, played 80 plus percent of the snaps. No, he played 41 snaps to Miles Gaskin's 26. I mean, Miles Gaskin really hadn't been with the team at all. I think Gaskin probably does become the lead running back again next week. So, I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, Duke Johnson possibly could finish out this week as the running back one. I don't necessarily think we're going to be playing him next week, however. And now another player that I don't necessarily think that we can trust is going to be someone that I told people to trust this week, Michael Carter. And with Michael Carter, he comes out, leads the team in snaps. He has 31 snaps compared to Tevin Coleman at 21. But I mean, just simply, this offense isn't good enough if you're not going to get every touch out of the backfield. And Tevin Coleman had eight carries here. I mean, also, also Austin Walker had two. So if you're seeing Michael Carter only have eight of the 18 carries in this offense, that's not going to get it done, especially when you only have two targets out of the backfield. So it looks like Michael Carter is not going to be a running back that you can go through and look to play. And now our last lesson learned is that it looks like Debo Samuel maybe is operating a little bit more as a receiver again. And Jeffrey Wilson is now going to be a running back that is a must start option for you in any week that Elijah Mitchell does not play. And keep in mind with Elijah Mitchell, he's dealing with a multitude of injuries here. It's not necessarily like Elijah Mitchell as a running back that just needs to get over a concussion. No, like there are multiple things going on. So I think there is a chance that Mitchell misses another week. And in that instance, you're going to have to go through and play Jeff Wilson Jr. He saw 50 snaps to Michael Hasty only with three. And remember two weeks ago, his first start, we are actually saying, you know what? Probably want to avoid him. They're going to use Debo Samuel. I'm also worried that, I mean, Jermichael Hasty is going to come in and be the receiving down running back here. Yeah, no, that didn't happen at all. Jeff Wilson just played every single snap. Now, yes, it was the game flow for him. This team led the entire time, but nonetheless got to 21 carries. It was a top five running back this week. I think you're not expecting that to change anytime soon. 
And I think that should be it. I realized that we did not give away those fantasy flock network ads at the beginning of the video. Let me give away a couple now. Let's give them away to David and Arch. Please make sure y'all not done so already. Go down there, drop a like, leave a comment, letting me know what you need to happen to win this week for you. Subscribe to the channel, even though I know everybody watching this is already subscribed. And most importantly, go sign up for Underdog Fantasy. Have a chance to win to come out to the Fantasy Flock meetup on January 15th. And I think that's all I got for you. Really hope that you enjoyed this video and really hope that you have a great day.